it's it's a it's a great uh, uh, pleasure um, to uh, to be introducing James Murray. Um, he is a, a, a person with a serious academic past as a as a classicist. He also has a serious legal present um, as a, um, a member of the law firm Taylor Binters. Free, free speech questions have um, over the last decade or so acquired a, a kind of salience and intensity of, of presence, which is pretty much, um, uh, which is very unusual, I think, in our own culture. And um, it's only over the last few years that we've been thinking about free speech in the same way perhaps that Americans have been thinking about it since the um, since their constitution was, was first amended. Um, ordinarily, our instincts, our own uh, English, British political instincts are not to have recourse to law to solve every political problem, but um, free speech questions appear to demand that kind of address, or at any rate, the inclusion of legal considerations in that kind of address. And uh, I can't think of anyone better to address the legal aspects of free speech, in particular academic free speech, than our uh, speaker tonight. So without anything further, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, James. Um, he'll speak for 40 or 45 minutes. Um, I have a, a, a blank screen with no questions yet <laughs> on it, but I hope that it will be crowded with questions by the time James finishes and then we'll try and get through them and more importantly the answers um, as efficiently as possible and there'll be a, a hard stop at quarter past seven. So James, over to you. Great, thank you Anthony and thank you Mark for that introduction. Uh, good evening everyone. So. I want to start this, this evening with a, with a journey back to ancient Athens. Now, you may think we're about to visit the illustrious Academy of Plato and Aristotle, birthplace of modern academia, but no. Instead, we open the doors to the thinkery of Socrates, as imagined by Aristophanes. Here it is described in the words of one of its students, Strepsides. That's the thinkery for clever minds. In there live men who argue and persuade if someone gives them cash, they'll teach him how to win an argument on any cause, just or unjust. Or in more prosaic terms, the thinkery is a mocking characterization of a school run by Aristophanes' imagined Socrates, which educates its students in the art of sophistry and pseudoscientific thinking. For instance, consider the new measurement of distance designed with the creation of small wax booties for fleas. At the thinkery, Strepsides, his wayward and gambling addict son, Phidippides, learns the way of wrong. The personification of the weaker argument, which nevertheless defeats the side of right and justice, and he overcomes his legitimate creditors and arguments. In other words, the thinkery teaches one to speak and speak well, but with the ultimate goal of victory in mind, rather than truth or justice. Why, though, you may ask, do we sully ourselves with the visit? to the satirical corruption of the academy, because I want to explore perhaps the most important and distinguishing <coughs> characteristics of the academy, academic freedom. In particular, I will examine the relationship between the right to freedom of expression and academic freedom, where they differ and where they overlap. Ultimately, I want to consider the question, would the free speech of the thinker Socrates qualify for the protection of academic freedom? But before we can answer that question, we need to start with some definitions. Academic freedom is a concept for which there is almost universal acceptance of its importance, but one for which there's no straightforward and universally accepted definition. As such, we start with the question, what is academic freedom and how is it distinct from freedom of expression generally? In my view, the clearest and most comprehensive definition of academic freedom appears in the 1997 UNESCO recommendation on higher education teaching personnel. I'll consider this in more detail later, but the crispest summary, uh, in my view, of the key principles is given by Professor Terence Caron. He says, the substantive elements are freedom to teach and research. Freedom to teach normally includes freedom to determine what shall be taught in the curriculum, how it shall be taught. Freedom to research normally includes the determination of what shall be researched, the research method, the purpose of the research, and where it is published. Karen also explains that these substantive principles are upheld by three supportive elements, namely self-governance, 
which includes voicing opinions on and being involved in the governance of the university, tenure and autonomy, both institutional and individual. In other words, the collective right to be free from external interference and the individual right to be free from inappropriate internal interference. From this definition, we can pick out, for example, disseminating research findings, elements which inherently demand a right to free expression. The, price, the, the precise parameters of that right is something I'll explore, though to be clear before moving on, I do think the individual right to academic freedom is more important than the institutional right to academic freedom, both, be, both because of the other, for example, business priorities and marketization of the institution, which may undermine the purpose of academic freedom, and because individual academic freedom is, as I will say, to be properly conceptualized as a human right. For now, let's consider the right to free expression more generally. As so much has been written about freedom of expression as a general right, I don't propose to offer a detailed definition. However, for the purposes of comparing it to academic freedom, I do want to offer a few thoughts on the breadth of that freedom. To do so, perhaps one of the best places to start is the classical justification for free expression as set out by John Stuart Mill on, in his essay on liberty. He says the following, the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of opinion is that it is robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. The opinion is right, they're deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. Mill thinks there's value in refuting all falsehoods, irrespective of their inherent worth, and so subject to his harm principle, it follows that such expression should be protected, even if it is intemperate, offensive, or passes the bounds of what he says is fair discussion. He goes on to say that it'd be rarely possible for the law to interfere with, quote, controversial misconduct, of which the gravest form for him is, quote, to argue sophistically, to suppress facts of arguments, to misstate the elements of the case, or misrepresent the opposite opinion. In other words, the, profession, the, the protection for free expression is very wide ranging for Mill, and we can conclude safely that even Aristophanes' Socrates and his sophistic rhetoric would fall within the ambit of its protection. The formulation of the right to, to free expression, which is most familiar to European audience, is that in Article 10 of the European Convention which is effectively incorporated into English law by the interpretive obligations of the Human Rights Act. So as is well known, the freedom is wide ranging in its modes, covering, for example, painting, protests, plays, et cetera, Char uh, its character covering artistic, political, journalistic expression and scope. On the latter point, the freedom extends not just to inoffensive ideas, but also those which offend, shock and disturb subject to certain absolute limitations, importantly for, for what I'm going to say later, Holocaust denial, and strictly construed restrictions prescribed by law as provided for under Article 10.2. This is a wide ranging right with no stringent entry qualifications for the freedom to be engaged. So having looked briefly at both concepts, now let's consider the differences. The classical distinction between academic freedom and free expression generally has been framed like this. Quote, we should think of campuses as having two different zones of free expression, a professional zone, which protects the expression of ideas, but imposes an obligation of responsible discourse and responsible conduct in formal education settings, and a larger free speech zone, where the only restrictions are those of society at large. Members of the campus community may say things in the free speech zones that they would not be allowed to say in the core educational and research environments. The key underpinning for this distinction can be summarized by the fact that at the most fundamental level, the operational goal of academic work should be to produce and disseminate knowledge and understanding. So with that in mind, what I want to explore is the distinction between free expression and academic freedom and examining how the law might bring these two, two together more closely with the concept of academic free expression. I will discuss what the, the law says about the parameters of academic free expression, in particular, how its protections are gained and how they might be lost. Overall, I want to explain why I conceptualize academic, academic free expression as a specialist hybrid kind of human right, which incorporates key characteristics of professional freedoms. 
So as far as the constitutional and legislative protection for academic freedom is concerned in the UK, again, Professor Terence Caron conducted a comparative study in 2007 and concluded that the UK was the sixth man of Europe. He summarised English law position thus, in sum, it is clear that the level of legal protection for academic freedom in the UK is deficient with respect to the constitutional protection when compared to other EU states. Given that UK academics have no job security, it's difficult to see what freedoms, if any, this deficient legal framework offers them in practice. Now, I think Karen's assessment is correct as far as it goes, but I don't think it gives sufficient consideration to the Human Rights Act and the incorporation of relevant Strasbourg jurisprudence. By virtue of that act, as is well known, courts and tribunals must take into account such case, uh, the Strasbourg case law when determining a question which has arisen in, in connection with the convention rights, including Article 10. UK legislation must also be read and given effect to by the courts in such a way, as far as it's possible to do, which is compatible with the convention. Furthermore, it's unlawful for the courts or public authorities, which often does include universities, to act in a way that's incompatible with the convention. This, is, this omission of Karen's work is significant because of a particularly enhanced level of protection which is afforded to academic free expression by Strasbourg. So, the case of Solgak and Turkey is a good starting point for our consideration of the character of academic free expression. This 2009 case concerned a construction professor who criticised the appointment of assistant professors and was then successfully sued for defamation in the Turkish courts by one such assistant. So it was relevant here that the impugned statements were made through the distribution of a paper at a scientific conference. The Strasbourg court found that this was a violation of the professor's right to his academic free expression, a concept which it recognised as flowing from his wider right to academic freedom generally. Although his comments were essentially value judgments, they were made on an issue of public importance, namely the assessment and appointment of promotions in universities. The court recognised that an academic value judgment is not necessarily susceptible to strict proof and indeed doesn't require it, provided there is a sufficient factual basis from which it flows. So in a comment which neatly sets, sets the stage for our discussion, the court said that it, quote, underlines the importance of academic freedom, which comprises the academic freedom to express freely their opinion about the institutional system in which they work, and freedom to distribute knowledge and truth without restriction. So to summarise the key case law from Strasbourg, the overriding characteristic of academic free expression is one of a supercharged Article 10 protection. The Strasbourg Court has said, once activated, it deserves, quote, the highest level of protection under Article 10, and that, quote, any restriction on the freedom of academics to carry out research and to publish their findings must be submitted to careful scrutiny, and the need for any restrictions must be established convincingly. Indeed, in the, in the very recent uh, 2022 case of Torres in Spain, even a modest censure without any actual sanction was too much of a fetter on academic free expression to be tolerated by the Strasbourg court. So this means that the protection for academic free expression is in fact stronger than non-academic expression. Um, and this can be seen clearly when it interacts with other, the rights of others, for example, under Article 8, right to privacy. On that, the Strasbourg court has said, with other things being equal, the absence or presence of an academic element will be decisive in finding whether any particular speech which would otherwise constitute an unlawful infringement of personal rights is in fact protected under Article 10. So overall what we can see is that academic free expression is at the pinnacle of Article 10 protection and it would be very difficult to show any restrictions on it even under Article 10 too are justified however minimal the sanction as any, any sanction is liable to have an impact on the academic's right to free expression and have a chilling effect in that regard. But the question, of course, arises, how does expression qualify for that protection? So to answer that, I think it's helpful to break down academic expression very broadly and, and, and roughly into two categories. 
The first being core academic expression, covering the central academic work, such as book, research papers, etc. And then secondly, ancillary academic expression, which would be covering extramural expression, dissemination of core academic expression, and generally expression which is flowing from an academic's professional competence or expertise as academic. Now, I'm not intending those categories to be overly rigid and necessarily all encompassing, but I do think they're a useful lens through, through which to consider the way Strasbourg has dealt with academic free expression and for making sense of the qualifying criteria it, it has described in two of its leading judgments, which I'll, I, I briefly want to discuss now. So taking core academic expression first, I think it's helpful here to, to discuss the case of Aksu and Turkey and its discussion of scholarly standards, which allowed the impugned expression in that case, uh, which was a book on the Roma, to be entitled to protection as academic free expression. So in that case, by way of brief recitation of the facts, Mr. Aksu was a gentleman of Roma origin and he complained about the book um, called The Gypsies of Turkey, published by the Turkish government and authored by an academic. He said that the book breached his Article 8 right to privacy because it contained offensive remarks about his Roma identity and, per and perpetuated neg stereo negative stereotypes about that community. The, the Strasbourg court ultimately dismissed his case and found that the local courts had struck the right balance between his rights and the Roma community's rights, balanced with the academic's Article 10 rights. So in doing so, what it emphasised was that uh, significant weight should be put on the report, which was prepared by seven university professors, which concluded the book was an academic study based on scientific research and in turn based on scientific data. The court noted that impugned passages within it should be considered within the context of the academic work as a whole and recognised that the method of research used by the academic was important in granting it protection. So in that case, the academic author had collected information from members of the Roman community, local authorities, and observed their lifestyle, quote, according to scientific observation principles. So with that in mind, the court concluded it had to submit to very careful scrutiny any restriction on his right to carry out research and publish his findings. So overall, what we're seeing in the Aksu case is a Strasbourg court validating a rigorous research methodology in an academic book as the basis for activating this enhanced protection for academic free expression. So moving on to ancillary academic expression, we've already seen from the case of Sorguk that academic value judgments outside of that core expression are still protected under the aegis of academic free expression. That protection was explored in greater detail by the court in the case of Erdogan in Turkey. So again, very briefly, the facts. In that case, Erdogan was a professor of constitutional law at a university in Ankara. He, he published an article in a quasi-academic quarterly, which was highly critical of the judges of Turkey's constitutional court in a decision to dissolve a political party. The judges then each successfully brought defamation claims against him in the Turkish courts. So when it came to weighing up the proportionality of this interference with his Article 10 rights, the court again underlined the importance of academic freedom and academic works, holding that, quote, academic freedom in research and in training should guarantee freedom of expression and of action, freedom to disseminate information and freedom to conduct research and distribute knowledge and truth without restriction. This principle meant it had to submit the restriction to, again, particularly careful scrutiny. Importantly, the court also recognised that protection for academic free expression would apply not just to the academic or scientific research itself, i.e. the core academic expression in my scheme, but also to, quote, views or opinions, even if controversial or unpopular, in the, in the areas of their research, expertise and competence. So in other words, extramural speech which flows from that research or their professional expertise competence as academics will be entitled to the same type of protection as the core academic expression. So in Erdogan's case, even though his comments were harsh and offensive value judgments, they had sufficient basis in fact and a sufficient connection to his academic expertise to be protected. 
The court interestingly also took note of the fact they appeared in a quasi-academic quarterly as opposed to a popular newspaper, though it doesn't in fact press this point too hard. In fact, the concurring opinion goes on to say that the place of publication will in fact not be a decisive factor. So it's helpful to, to, to pause a moment on that, on that dissenting opinion. Three of the judges in that case produce a very helpful concurring opinion, which draws out some general principles for consideration of case, in cases of academic free expression, in particular with respect to extramural speech, which, which would include addresses to the general public and arguably also uh, comments on Twitter and things like that. So it notes the special status of academic free expression as compared to other types of free expression. It says because of the hugely significant import of academic expression, the court needs to take into account, quote, the need to communicate ideas, which is protected for the sake of the advancement of learning, knowledge and science. Again, what the court is doing here is emphasising the special character of academic freedom, as realised in, in Article 10 under the guise of academic free expression. So it highlights, with reference to Professor Erdogan's case, how extramural academic discourse flowing from their research or professional expertise and competence serves the public interest and is crucial in guaranteeing democracy. Such speech deserves, quote, the highest level of protection under Article 10. And the presence of this academic element will usually be decisive in determining whether the impugned speech is in fact protected under Article 10. So the concurring judgment gives us a useful test for determining whether speech uh, extramural speech, in, in, in my terms, ancillary academic speech, has a sufficient academic element to merit the utmost protection of Article 10. So according to that test, what one needs to establish is whether the individual is an academic, and then whether the contested expression falls within the area of their research, or more generally within their professional expertise and competence. So, in summary, because, because Professor Erdogan's words were even though they were offensive value judgments, quote, part of an explanatory opinion based on a scholarly analysis conducted by a professional academic in his field of research, they had a sufficient academic element and were entitled to the supercharged Article 10 protection. So we can see, therefore, that ancillary academic expression, in the words of the court here, quote, informed opinions, are integral parts of the freedom needed for academics to play their role in informing the public and guaranteeing democracy. So the notion that academic freedom can be considered to have the characteristics of professional freedom is also supported by how the concept of academic freedom was conceptualized in the UNESCO recommendation. So the purpose of the recommendation is to describe the parameters of academic freedom and to recognize its importance to quote, the development of humanity and modern society. So the recommendation is expansive in its description of individual rights and freedoms, which academics enjoy and should enjoy to properly perform their role. It summarizes academic freedom in this way, quote, the right without restriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom of teaching and discussion freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing the results thereof, freedom to, to express freely their opinion about the institutional system in which they work, freedom from institutional censorship, and the freedom to participate in professional or representative bodies. However, these rights are carefully circumscribed by the recommendation, and it contains a long and detailed list of the attendant duties and responsibilities. So by way of example, the recommendation cites the need for academics to, quote, base their research and scholarship on an honest search for knowledge with due respect for evidence, impartial reasoning and honesty in reporting. And it also talks of the need for them to be conscious of the responsibility when speaking, out, speaking or writing outside scholarly channels on matters not related to their professional expertise to avoid misleading the public on the nature of that expertise. So overall, what the recommendation gives us is probably the most comprehensive overview in an international instrument of the nature of the rights of individual academics to academic freedom, along with the detailed consideration of the duties and responsibilities which sit alongside such rights, conceived through this prism of professionalism. 
My view is that this would be entirely consistent with the way Strasbourg has been considering academic free expression today. So by way of further support for that contention on the notions of professionalism and minimum standards, I think we can draw a useful analogy here with the more established body of Strasbourg case law on the rights and responsibilities of journalistic free expression. So by way of a brief summary of the Article 10 case law on journalism, Strasbourg has acknowledged that the press plays a vital role as a public watchdog and as a preeminent role in a state governed by the rule of law. However, the enhanced rights to free expression which journalists enjoy are not unlimited. But what are those limits? Strasbourg does give us some further assistance here. It has, it has said that journalistic free expression is, quote, subject to the proviso that they are acting in good faith on an accurate factual basis and provide reliable and precise information in accordance with the ethics of journalism. Now, of course, those principles will, will be applied in a fact-sensitive um, way. And I don't think we need to necessarily overly concern ourselves with what the ethics of journalism might demand. What we're interested in here is whether the Strasbourg courts would apply a similar set of responsibilities to academic free expression in future cases. My answer is that I think they would. We have already seen that Strasbourg has done this to a significant extent in the case law which explicitly addresses academic free expression. In addition to that, the courts have said, in respect of the proviso in relation to journalistic free expression, that the same principle must apply to others who engage in similar public debate. And it has also indicated that it considers academics to be um, sharing journalists' role as a public watchdog. So then, in future cases, I think it'd be reasonable to infer that Strasbourg would adopt further general principles to underpin the minimum responsibilities for academic free expression, namely that it must be, borrowing here from the UNESCO recommendation, in accordance with their professional responsibility and subject to nationally and internationally recognized professional principles of intellectual rigor, scientific inquiry and research ethics. What though for the time being might we say further about the outer limits of academic free expression and where that protection might be lost. So I want to return again very briefly to the, to the case of Axel in Turkey. So we find a good, good example there of where the courts might draw a line. So it was relevant in that case to the decision of the majority that the book did not make blanket negative statements about all Romers. However, we should also consider the dissenting opinion of the judge in that case. It was her view that the book in question was in fact perpetuating neg negative stereotypes of Roma and stated that, quote, the fact that the book had been written by an academic and therefore to be considered as an academic work is neither a justification nor an excuse for insulting ethnic dignity. To support that contention, she referred to Article 2 of a 1978 UNESCO declaration, which states, quote, any theory that involves the claim that racial or ethnic groups are inherently superior or inferior, or which bases value judgments on racial differentiation, has no scientific founding, a foundation and is contrary to moral and ethical principles of humanity. On the facts in Aksu, the, the majority didn't agree with that assessment, uh, that, that her conclusion that that's what the academics work was doing with respect to Roma people. However, it seems likely that had the book strayed into intentionally denigrating an entire racial group, the court would have afforded it little or no protection despite it being an academic work. So <clears throat> what that says is, it seems likely that there will be little protection for work from an academic if it is expounding theories which involve the claim that a racial or ethnic group are inherently inferior or superior, or which bases value judgments on racial differentiation. I think that is indeed entirely consistent with the rest of the Strasbourg case law on academic free expression. And more generally note that at Article 17 of the convention prevents the use of convention rights to abolish or limit the rights of others. Which, is, which are otherwise guaranteed by the convention. In practice, what this means is that certain speech is considered beyond the pale by Strasbourg, and certain speech will be worthy of no protection under the convention. And accordingly, it follows that no protection is academic free expression. Again, as will be relevant for what I'll discuss later, Holocaust denial would be a key example of that. 
So finally, I want to address very briefly one instance in which a university as an employer might expect or indeed hope that the protection is lost and expression is lawfully restrictable under Article 10.2, namely the protection of the institution's reputation. Unfortunately for the institutions in that regard, Strasbourg courts have been very clear that the dignity of an institution can't be equated to that of the academics. The court considers that the protection of the university's authority is a mere institutional interest. So why does all of that matter? Well, it matters because more and more we are seeing intense disputes on our campus over issues of academic freedom and academic free expression. This has prompted the government to legislate in the form of the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill. I'll come back to that in more detail later, but I want to consider two recent and highly emotive cases, those of David Miller and Kathleen Stock. Now, the facts of those cases will be very well known to those interested in the issue of academic freedom, so I will rehearse them only very briefly here. So David Miller was formerly employed by the University of Bristol and was dismissed having been accused of anti-Semitism, promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, inciting hatred against Jewish students, etc. This incident received extensive coverage in the national media and naturally his supporters claimed his dismissal was in breach of his right to academic freedom. Kathleen Stock was formerly employed by the University of Sussex and was forced to resign after being subject to an intense campaign of bullying and harassment by her critics, who claimed that she was guilty of, quote, transphobia. So this, again, this incident received extensive cover coverage and is still being debated and discussed in Parliament to this day. So I highlight these cases because I think they work very, very well together as a pair to illustrate the principles of academic free expression which I've already discussed. I was prompted to address these two incidents in, in particular by the work of Professor Julius. He has written very convincingly in my view that quote, while both Miller and Stock can claim the benefit of political free expression, only Stock can claim the benefit of academic free expression. He came to that conclusion by examining, examining the liberal doctrine of free speech and identifying two central qualities, the system principle and the emancipation principle. That will be familiar to everyone who was at his lecture in this series last year. So the former separates out different forms of speech, academic from political, artistic, legal, etc., populates it with actors and institutions, and then develops its own peculiar standards for regulation. What I've been discussing so far is a very good example of this system principle in operation, with respect to the distinctiveness and regulation of academic free expression. Professor Julius has encapsulated this very well when he says, quote, it has standards. It is severe in its judgments. Among its requirements, objectivity, rigor, integrity. Dumb courses devised and taught by academics are not protected by the liberal academic free speech doctrine. The emancipation principle Julius identified is what he calls the combative edge of the liberal doctrine and acts to combat counter discourses, ways of thinking that is that in their irrationality are damaging to liberal societies. With respect to academic free expression, the edge is turned against the pseudosciences, creationism, astrology, alchemy, etc., and entails a positive obligation to exclude those from the academy in the name of academic integrity. So turning to those two controversies, Professor Julius's view is of uh, Dr. Stock's most recent book was that it was a serious work by a serious academic, but in very sharp contrast to that, his view of Miller's work is that it contains no academic substance, and that, quote, his conspiracy mongering is actively inimical to academic values. Of Miller's work, he said, the feeble, everything that should matter to an academic, methodology, research, history, history evidence, the forcible, everything that an academic should shun, Extravagate, extravagant claims, which were unmoored from evidence, the anti-Semitic premises, the verbal assaults on Jewish students, assaults which are the inevitable outcome of his writing and speech making. Now, I don't propose to undertake a detailed assessment of the nature of Stock and Miller's work, but if we accept Professor Julius's conclusion and ac academic judgment there, and put Miller's work, most contested work into the realm of anti-Semitic conspiracy theorizing, 
In my view, we can, can safely conclude that the relevant English and international law support Professor Julius's philosophical stance of differentiating between political and academic free expression and granting the protection of the latter only to Dr. Stark. The lack of academic substance in Miller, as Julius puts it, disqualifies him from the enhanced protection of academic free expression as I've described it. Now, lacking essential academic elements is one thing, but the conspiracist, theory, conspiracist thinking is perhaps even worse than that. If it adopts the trappings of academic discourse in that it is pseudo-critical, pseudo-evidence-based thinking, and that is also simultaneously anti-academic in that it provides no real mechanism for fortification. Now that conclusion would be in my view on, on all fours with the way Strasbourg jurisprudence is developing and the distinctions which it draws. So, with the introduction of the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, I think understanding these distinctions is going to be crucial, most particularly so for the, director of, the new Director of Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom, who would be, I think, very well advised to become adept at interrogating those boundaries. So for those of you who have not been following the bill, the new director will have a very busy and demanding role. He will be responsible for the Office for Students' free speech functions, including monitoring and enforcing the new registration conditions, promoting free speech and academic freedom, producing the guidance on them, monitoring students' unions, monitoring overseas funding, and administering the new free speech complaint scheme. So, a running theme throughout the bill is the distinction which draws between freedom of speech and academic freedom for academic staff. In light of that, I think it's worth interrogating how the bill defines and distinguishes these concepts and analyse how the bill will fit within the legal context of the Human Rights Act and the Strasbourg jurisprudence, which I've already discussed. So freedom of speech under the bill is, is defined as follows the freedom to express ideas, beliefs, and views without suffering adverse consequences. So far, so, so obvious, that is rather the point of the freedom, and I, I don't think that definition is adding much new. The crucial caveat in the bill is that speech must be within the law. Now, that phrase is taken from the existing similar duty under the Education Act 86, which, when introduced in pre-Human Rights Act times, probably meant something like the English law common law conception of free speech, which had been articulated by Lord Hoffman thus. It means the right to say things which right-thinking people regard as dangerous or irresponsible. The freedom is subject only to clearly defined exceptions laid down by common law or statute. So for example, speech which is defamatory or contrary to criminal law would not be protected. This of course can be very difficult to demonstrate in a university context, particularly considering the criminal burden of proof. And that is, of course, much higher than the civil burden. More difficult and usually more relevant to the university context is the interaction with civil wrongs, in particular harassment under the Equality Act. Now, that being said, unless harassment can be shown to be purposeful, it is generally difficult to show that harassment has occurred in an academic context or where the impugned speech is otherwise protected as academic free expression. The immediate objection to that interpretation of within the law is what about Holocaust denial? So aside from certain specific instances, again, harassment under the Equality Act being the prime example, that is, of course, not specifically outlawed in the UK as it is in other countries. The gap here is filled by the Human Rights Act and the Convention. So as discussed earlier, public authorities and the courts must, give re must read and give effect to as far as it's possible to do primary legislation in a way which is compatible with the convention when determining any issue concerning convention rights. And it must also take into account the Strasbourg case law. In other words, I think the courts will read within the law through the lens of the convention and won't extend the protection of the bill to Holocaust deniers, falling outside the scope of the protection under Article 10 as they do. Finally, I think it's, it's important for what I'll say later to remember that the right to free speech will include the right to academic free expression, something which will extend to academics irrespective of whether they're employed by the institution or merely visiting. This makes it a more powerful duty than it first might appear, 
and leads us, leads us on to considering what additionally the definition of academic freedom in the bill is offering. So that is defined as uh, academic freedom for academic staff is defined as the freedom within the law to question and test receive wisdom, to put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without them placing themselves as being adversely affected by loss of their job or privileges or the likelihood of securing promotion or jobs being reduced. So much of that definition won't be new for universities as it closely mirrors the definition of academic freedom that they have in most of their governing documents. It's also one of the public interest governance principles which universities are obliged to comply with as it stands. However, I don't think it's a satisfactory definition if one considers the definitions of academic freedom we've discussed above. These focus on the broader rights to research and to teach, as well as attendance rights, such as academic free expression. Indeed, the bill's definition focuses much more on expression than crucial elements intrinsic to the rights to teach and research, such as determining the curriculum, how it's taught, or the focus, purpose, collaborations of research. One might say that such rights are implicit in the bill's definition, but I think that is rather a stretch, and I think they will only be brought in to the extent they've been explicitly recognised by the Strasbourg jurisprudence. At the very least, leaving such matters to implication is, to my mind, very unsatisfactory, given that Parliament had a blank piece of paper when drafting this bill. The other most striking difference um, to what we've been discussing with respect to academic freedom is the absence of any notion of minimum responsibilities and standards, which, which are, as I discussed earlier, associated with definitions of academic freedom generally, and academic free expression under the Strasbourg case law. Unlike some of the missing elements I mentioned above, I don't think the Strasbourg jurisprudence rises in to impose those minimum standards in, in all cases, just because the individual in question is academic. It may be that a member of academic staff says something which doesn't reach the standard of academic free expression as conceived by Strasbourg, but it does still fall within the bill's definition of academic freedom. So for example, a theatre studies professor may totally deny anthropogenic climate change. That doesn't obviously flow from their professional competence or expertise, nor would it obviously have an academic element, but it does test receive wisdom and would, would be controversial. Such speech would be more exposed to legitimate interference by the university under Article 10.2, because it would, it would lack the enhanced protection as academic free expression. But it wouldn't be incompatible with the convention for parliament to afford additional speech protection to academics in that, in that situation. The Office for Student effectively already does this by employing a near identical definition of academic freedom. Indeed, reading down the bill to reduce the scope of the protection which Parliament has intended would not be required for compatibility with the Convention. So these differences do give rise to the question, how exactly is the speech element of the definition, the questioning and putting forward part, materially different from the general right to free expression, particularly as understood through the lens of the Strasbourg jurisprudence on academic free expression. It would be very strange, I think, to suggest the general right doesn't entail the freedom to question and test received wisdom or put forward controversial opinions. I think, unfortunately, the answer is that it doesn't add very much. Instead, what the bill does add is an explicit right for academic staff to demand and and enforced through the tort or complaint scheme that their universities take reasonably practicable steps to ensure they're not at risk of losing their jobs, privileges, etc. i.e. it introduces enhanced process duty. But looking at the bill in that way gives rise to two worrying implications. Does the general duty to secure free speech for others on campus not include a right to be free of the risk of losing their jobs? And can the duty for academic staff be discharged by simply putting in place appropriate processes and risk mitigation. So in other words, is the duty not a prohibition on the dismissal itself? So how should the academic champion conceive of the speech rights under the new bill? I think the answer is that there's essentially four sets of speech rights in the, in, concerned in the, in the legislation. So first you have the ordinary free expression, which is subject to the core process duty to take reasonably practicable steps to secure it, i.e. the normal process duty. Second, you have the ordinary free, free expression of academic, which does not qualify as academic free expression, 
our theatre studies professor, but which is still subject to the enhanced process duty, albeit not the protection under the convention. So third, you have academic free expression of a visiting speaker, which is subject to the normal process duty because they're not a member of the provider's academic staff, but it is entitled to the enhanced protection under the convention. And lastly, you have the academic free expression of the member of staff, which is entitled to both the enhanced process duty and the enhanced convention protection. As one can see, I don't think it will be an easy task for the champion or the courts to unpick these four categories of speech in any given case. So one of the most significant issues I see with the bill is the failure to properly grapple with the distinction between free speech on campus generally and academic freedom more specifically. So if, we're, if one considers what the literature says about the nature of academic freedom and academic free expression. And I think it's a real problem to muddy that distinction between academic freedom and free speech generally. I think such confusion in the bill also chips away at the key philosophical underpinnings for academic freedom, namely pursuit of the ultimate goal of truth and knowledge production in a democratic society. So with all that in mind, let's conclude by returning to Thinkery. So we've already seen that Mill would probably extend his conception of free speech to Socrates' pseudo-scientific pontificating about the farts of a gnat and his sophistic rhetoric generally. Such speech too would fall within the, the scope of the ordinary protection of Article 10, though he should perhaps not expect too much protection if there's a clash with the rights of others. The question is, does such speech have the academic element required to qualify as academic free expression? So while I, I admit I'm not a scientist, I would suggest that Socrates' approach of taking a basket on the end of a rope so as to better observe the properties of the sun is probably not in line with modern methodological or other scientific norms. Mm -hmm. As such, I think we can conclude his work on physical phenomena probably doesn't qualify as core academic expression. But what about the things he says while employing his sophistic rhetoric? I think here too, he's going to struggle. This would be speech which is not necessarily flowing from an expert grounding or informed opinion with a basis in truth. It might happen to be, but the fact that truth is not the goal, there is a serious risk there is no such grounding. Of course, given the skill of the sophistic rhetoric employed, it will be a monumental task to tell the difference between an intellectual fraudster and an academic genuinely seeking to further truth and knowledge i.e. to draw the line between a future Miller and a future stock. Now, I think that demarcation problem will be the most challenging question with, with which the academic champion and the courts will have to grapple. Um, and I think it will be with the help of the academy more generally that they will need to grapple with that question. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, we've got a question from Edward Isaacs, um, who is a, a University of Bristol politics and international relations student, and he asks the question, um, as I understand the question, are we setting the bar too high in addressing um, what he describes as illegitimate uh, campus speech, if the bar is the Equality Act bar of uh, creating a, an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment. I, I think that the, inter the interaction between the Equality Act and um, academic free expression is, is a really interesting mm. one. And I think what, what it's important to remember is, is when it comes to the Section 26 definition of harassment, that as I mentioned this earlier, when it concerns purposeful harassment, it's going to be very difficult to say that that is lawful free speech. But of course, it's, it's generally very difficult to show that someone is purposefully seeking to harass someone else. Generally, what the question is going to be is, is whether the effect, whether the effect created is one of harassment, intimidating environment, etc. And when it comes to that, you have a, essentially an objective test and one which takes into account all the circumstances of the relevant case. Now, in that situation, 
the relevant circumstances are going to be the Strasbourg case law. So really the, the proper way to think about it, if we're in this realm of the objective test, is to go through the kind of test that I've been talking about. You know, is the speech in question <coughs> core academic expression? You know, if it is, it's very unlikely that it's going to be uh, reasonable that it amounts to harassment under the Equality Act. Where it comes to the ancillary academic experience, uh, expression, you know, it's, it's going to be more difficult. So essentially what you're going to be doing is seeing if it's flowing from the academics kind of underlying research or their expertise or professionalism generally. So it's so so the question is not really is that the bar? The question is, is this core academic expression? And so how does that then interact with the, with the Equality Act? We've got a question from um, Julian Square. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was a, a very uh, thought provoking talk. And I had a question uh, that hopefully you can provide some guidance on. Um, there was something in the reasoning of the, the Turkish case about Roma, uh, and especially in the minority judgment that left me a bit concerned, if only because as far as I understand what you said, um, if the facts of the case had been different, and if this book really was just an absolute racist broadside, then the minority position might very well have been correct and it wasn't protected. Um, I don't want to mischaracterize what you said about that, the minority position in that case. I, I think that's probably right. Right. And as far as I understand the reasoning that underpins that minority decision, it's that the value that is being undermined, which is, you know, absolute anti-racism um, is being undermined by that speech is can't be questioned by that speech. So the, the, the value is so strong that there's just no scope for speech that attacks in that racist way, given our commitment to anti-racist principles. I, th I think it's very hard to draw any kind of bright lines on that issue. I think there is, there is a, a body of case law around perpetuating of, of stereotypes where there is a certain point where you can kind of cross that line. Um, well, so just in particular, because you said the minority judge quoted a, a convention or something, and the yeah. opposite, and, and yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the, I'll, I'll I'll explain the, the purpose of my question, which is okay. social norms change over time, and obviously, I suspect everyone in this room entirely agrees that the sort of speech that the minority judge had in mind is unacceptable. But I'm thinking back over a longer period of time and thinking that there were some other uh, values, sacred values, that nowadays we wouldn't hold. So, for example, the sort of academic work of someone like Galileo, mm. questioning genuinely sacred cows about the structure of the Earth in the universe, mm. which caused gross offence to obviously huge amounts of people at the time, but with the benefit of 500 years, mm. uh, we see is wrong. So whilst I'm not questioning at all the result in the Turkish case, what I'm saying is that reasoning seems to me to say that there are some sacred cows which academics may not be able to challenge, because it's not just received wisdom, but it's sort of holy wisdom. And if that can change over time, perhaps it's going to be a problem for some academics who are challenging that sort of wisdom under the free speech rules. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. I, th I think if you're, if you're asking, are there, are there bright lines in the way that the Strasbourg jurisprudence works? I think, I think yes, because of the way that uh, Article 17 in particular is operating. So if it, you know, for example, if it pertains to something like Holocaust denial, I think you're going to be struggling significantly to, to get yourself into Article 10 because of that. So is there a bright line? Yes, there is, but I think it is set quite far down the track. And I think what you would say, you know, perhaps I don't want to speak out turn on Professor Julius's view on this. I think you would say, well, that sort of stuff is going to be so counter to what the kind of core academic values are. It's, you know, inherent rubbish that you're never gonna, you're in the wrong sort of realm when you're talking about that sort of material, which is at the outer extreme under Article 17, which is denied the protection. And you I don't, don't think Galileo could have been characterized like that at the time as well? I don't think so, no. I, I don't know if you- It's such an unusual experience for me to hear people speaking on my behalf about- I'm sorry, I hope I uh, represented I just, you. No, no, uh, you've done, <laughs> I'm sure you've done better than I could. I think the mistake that's being made is thinking that the question is one of balancing 
rather than the internal quality of the discourse under examination. So yes, of course you can say, well, it may be that in certain cases, academics free speech is, is trumped by a concern to, um, uh, to protect minorities against hostile stereotyping, which is, I think, the way you're constructing it. And then you say, well, what about Galileo and, and received Catholic sentiment? But if, on the other hand, you take the view that academic speech has its own internal minimum criteria against which it has to be uh, measured before it can make claims, then you don't have those balancing difficulties and you simply say if Galileo was conforming to the minimum protocols required of scientific investigation, then that's good enough. I think that's the, that's the point. We have another question from John Guber, so it probably has to be the last question. I'm just going to read it out. Would a Nazi salutation by a solicitor inside the court during trial be tolerated in the UK and international courts. I'm not sure this is an academic free speech question, but you know, let's be generous um, in our parameters. In Greece, this has been the case twice in the trial against the Golden Dawn neo-Nazi group um, that had assassinated uh, Pavlos Fissas. The solicitor in question, who also is the father of an incumbent minister, has not suffered any consequences. Is this lawful? Well, um, um, I just leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Do you want uh, to lean over? Would you make a Nazi police in court be protected? I, it, I, I it's a question of legal free, law free speech, isn't it? I, I, well, I suspect that's in real territory of Article 17 and falling outside of the protection entirely. I can't imagine the context in which he was. Really, I suppose it depends on the context. If it's to illustrate a point. <laughs> you know, the, then the defendant made a Nazi salute, and this is what it looks like. Well, <laughs> Perhaps it's okay, it's the, but if he's doing I mean, it to, to whom was he? Right. To whom is he offering the salutation? <laughs> is another question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm sorry, we have a question at the back. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent talk. You gave the example of David Miller, whose work I'm not, not familiar with, but if, if his work was Holocaust denial, then obviously none of us would support that. In the same way, we wouldn't support any distortion of uh, or denial of historical or objective fact. But in the case of Kathleen Stock, um, she, she actually was forced out because her university did not, did not uphold her, her right to free speech or to academic freedom. Uh, she was, she was called, quote, transphobic, merely because she asserted that sex is immutable. She denied gender and asserted sex. And, and so what is happening now at a place like, in, in a public authority like university, is that a sacred cow is being created, which apparently is beyond challenge. A social norm is being created by force. And this is not limited to, to public authorities. It's happening even within the human rights field, where there are some chambers which are forcing their members to, uh, to accept transgender as an ideology, like Garden Court Chambers, uh, and this case against Alison Bailey, and there are others as well. Uh, there's the human rights uh, group, which is trying to force one of its members <coughs> out because, because he supports the Equality Act and the women-only spaces uh, uh, under the Equality Act. I mean, he said, I heard him say, mm. you know, he's pro-woman, he's pro-science. Mm. So the... The, we have the a two problem on timing now. Uh, I, I do apologize. No, no, no. So, no, so the, the, the examples you give are slightly contradictory because there's one which is about um, if it is Holocaust denial. It's not and there's Holocaust one denial. and there's one which is which is which is about the the failure of the university yes, to no. to <clears throat> to protect her academic freedom. Yes, uh, yes, to be clear, we're not saying that Miller is a Holocaust denial. Um, Sorry, what, what precisely is was the question? Um, well, the, 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 the two examples you give yes. are, are not comparable because Catholic stock is being forced out because of the failure of the university uh, of freedom, however you define it. Uh, well, yes, I, I think, well, Kathleen <coughs> Stock resigned because of the failure of the university to, to support her and support her academic freedom. That, that, that's right. Uh, 
But I, I think that, that I think it's both. I think it's fair to compare them both as a pair of academic freedom cases. Uh, I mean, Miller was one of the reasons he was dismissed because of what he was saying about Jewish students. So similarly, like you know, there were kind of speech offences in the context of work they've been doing as academics. So I think I think they are kind of comparable, and I think they sit nicely together as a pair. One way you can say, you know, well. He's not entitled to protection because of the poor quality of his work, essentially, and she is entitled to protection because of the high quality of her work. Um, and I was I was grateful to Professor Julius's academic judgment there, and, and sort of wrote on the back of that to an extent. Okay, well, we know where the main responsibility lies now. Um, <laughs> um, I, one of the one of the limitations on academic freedom that no one complains about is closing meetings. So um, <laughs> I'm um, I'm I'm now going to. And over to Mark, who is going to do it, or should I do it? I can if you'd like. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your for, for coming for your questions. Um, I know there were some questions that you didn't get a chance to, to ask, and we really hope that you will have the the opportunity and you will join us for that drinks reception. You will have the opportunity to pose further questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was a real pleasure.